What's up, everyone? It's Wednesday, February 1st, 2017, and it's time to go to work on music. And I wish I was starting February a little stronger, but, you know, stuff happens. Yesterday was a good day on the music front. A little behind today, but not irrevocably, so just going to make the best use of the time I have. Um, and you guys are really watching me grapple with this recently, and it's, it's a little embarrassing, but... That's real, and that's what this vlog is about, is showing the real, just the realness of, <laughs> of all of it. Just trying to be as honest as possible, man. Trying to be as honest as possible. It's, it takes something, but, you know, that's, I think, what artists are supposed to do. So, anyway, um, it's going to be a good day. I'm going to hit some online classwork. It's going to be kind of short, just to save time. I'm going to do a little bit of guitar work again on the short side, a little bit of production work just move the move the dial forward there and I've realized like while that's often one of the more, more challenging things to do in the practice session like that is the thing I think that gives me the most satisfaction is like really moving the dial forward on the creative front and actually producing new stuff and I think that's the way that I'm going to hit my my own personal goals the quickest not that my instrumental goals aren't incredibly important to me I just um I just don't know if I want to be like a great player who never produces anything, you know what I'm saying? Um, but I'll think more about that. Maybe I do. Anyway, let's do this. Alright, um, interesting information about bit width in my music technology class, just talking about what happens when you degrade the bit width <laughs> and listening to the, the sonic changes, which is really, really interesting. And it just got me thinking about the way sound travels through air and how there's usually no corruption, but there, I guess there almost it is always corruption because like the quality of the air molecules, the space that you're in, like even if you're listening to live music, even though it's super high fidelity, like there still might be things that are distorting the information in any given situation, so maybe a digital medium isn't all that different, it's just a more unique medium, you know. But I guess at the end of the day we're trying to make stuff sound as good as it can when we're recording, so, you know, there's where a lot of that analog warp comes from, and just trying to go for the best fidelity possible. Now another good tip that he was bringing up is making sure that you're using as much of the dynamic range as you can without clipping which I think was a really good tip, because when you're only using a small amount of dynamic range, you're effectively just wasting bits. You're just recording at a lower resolution, which uh, is re a really interesting way of thinking about that that I had never considered before. So shout out to that class for being awesome. <laughs> um, then I was reading in the Harmony book that a lot of hit songs are based on grooves, and it's something that I hadn't thought about very much, but it makes a lot of sense now that I thought about some really groovy songs, like some Rage Against the Machine tracks, or like... There's a song by Kenny Wayne Shepherd called Blue on Black that's a great track, um, but just the groove is so noticeable. I mean, it's just uh, it's just got such an amazing rhythmic feel that even though the harmony isn't all that innovative, the, the track just has a great vibe. Um, I was thinking about some Tower of Power stuff where it's like this up-tempo kind of party vibe, 16th note thing, um, where you think about some you know really deep James Brown cuts that are just like ah oh, fuck I gotta move you know I gotta it moves you the groove has a real impact on the listener um, and I was just reflecting on how the grooves in those songs really do serve to emphasize the message of the song there's there's prosody there there's everything fits together to support the overall message of the song and uh, that just like really was sort of like a deep insight that I hadn't really I mean, I guess I always understood it intuitively, but I hadn't really thought about it explicitly. And uh, it's just awesome, man. I'm just loving this learning process so much, guys. I would really encourage you to just pick something that you want to know more about and just buy a book or take a free online class. I mean, the amount of money I've invested in this is comically low versus the value that I'm getting out of, of participating in the material. So something to think about. Uh, let's play some guitar.
All right, so what I was just doing there is uh, working through a tune called Autumn Leaves. It's, it's a jazz standard, and just trying to dissect some of the harmony involved. Um, so looking at the voice leading, both on the guitar neck and on paper, and what voice leading is is just like how the different notes of each chord move from chord to chord. So like, let's say I'm changing from an A major to an A minor, um, you know, every note would stay the same except the third note and the scale would move down. And that's, that would be like considered, <laughs> I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert in classical harmony, but like basically your voice leading, you want, <clears throat> you want it to be as melodious as possible. Like it's almost like having several melodies going at the same time and you don't want too much movement happening between voices. And, and this is just like classical harmony basics, and I don't even know if I'm explaining that well or the right way, but at the end of the day, you, you also recognize that like a lot of counterpoint rules from back in the day are broken all the time in popular music, and it's, it's really not that big a deal, but I think it's an interesting intellectual exercise, and I just want to understand that stuff really deeply, and that, that's really satisfying to me. So, um, doing a little bit of that, and um, then I was working on what I was talking about before from the Harmony book, which is just copying a groove from Blue on Black, and I was working on that with the metronome to try to get it tight, because I noticed my finger placement wasn't as ideal as I wanted it to be. And that's some a big, big thing I've been working on in my guitar playing since I got back from Via Academy, is just working on my sound, my tone, and my control. Like, even if I just have to play everything really slowly, I want it to sound like how I want it to sound, you know what I mean? Like, I don't want to rush something and have it sound crappy. It's like, there's no point in playing fast and sounding bad. Like, that just doesn't make any sense. And it's amazing how much speed you can simulate just by playing really clean. Like, playing something clean at a medium to medium high tempo sounds really fast because it's so even and well executed. Um, and that's something I'm, I'm trying to think about a lot these days. Um, because, you know, one big thing Steve Vai said that I thought was really powerful, even though I think he said it sort of offhandedly, is like, I could teach anyone to be a virtuoso instrumentalist. Like, there's only three rules. Um, never play anything that sounds bad. Play everything perfectly. And start slow and speed it up over time. <laughs> and it was just like, boom, you know, like, that's the dude who would know <laughs> how to make that happen, you know. So I think he said it in a way where he kind of didn't want people to do that, but I think that that's why I went to the camp, was to kind of like figure out like what's the secret sauce. And of course it ends up being some stuff that's extraordinarily simple, but relatively difficult to put into practice for most humans. Um, so I'm working on that, you know, I'm working on slowing myself down, working on my control, working on hearing the tone in my head, and trying to get that to come out the right way. Like, he spent some time talking about his time with Frank Zappa, and how Zappa said his tone sounded like an electric ham sandwich, <laughs> which was really funny. And then Frank Zappa told him, your tone's in your head, your tone's not in your fingers, it's, or in the amp, it's in your head. And it got me really thinking about, like, um, what is the sound that I want to hear, you know? What is the sound I want to hear, and how can I translate that through the instrument? So, shout out to Vi Academy, the value is coming through, man. It's coming through, slowly but surely, and I'm happy about that. So I was just working on that stuff, working on execution, and um, now I'm going to take a short break and, uh, and do a little bit of production work. All right, guys, really good day at the office here. Um, man, I just had, had a pretty major breakthrough there, actually, just thinking about everything I've been digesting today, thinking about the groove of a track and feel. And I realized that's really the thing that's been missing from my recordings. Like, the way I hear it in my head, it has so much vibe and so much feel that I'm like, yes, I'm hooked into this, this is happening, I'm loving this. And that's not translating to the recordings, I don't think. I mean, I'm gonna go ba I'll go back and listen to the different parts and I'll weed out the stuff that works and doesn't work. And there's some production elements that I want to tweak, but in terms of like the mix and stereo balance and stuff like that, but really, I think that needs to come from the performances. I, I think, you know, the sounds are really important, and I want that to be crispy and beautiful and awesome, and, like, 
I'm not going to skimp on that this year. But I think the more important thing is the foundation. The, this is, I'm so glad that this book is really making this point and that it's sinking in for me finally. I mean, it's it might sound trivial or something, but this is like a big thing that just hit for me in my head. Because I didn't have that much time left scheduled in the session, so I thought, well, let me just... Let me just sing through this song that I feel like isn't working and let me try to feel out what's wh where I want it to go. And I've just realized that the groove and the feel of everything, the whole track, the way the instruments are interplaying, is not telling the story that I want it to tell. It's just, it's just empty. It doesn't have that vibe, that feeling that I want it to have. And I think I've been trying to fix that by production, techni technical elements and stuff like that. And all that stuff is awesome, but you can't polish a turd. <laughs> I mean, that saying is just, it's too accurate, man. You know, it's, if you've got something that's beautiful underneath and you polish it, it's going to look even more amazing. If you've got something ugly and you polish it, it's just going to look like something ugly that got polished, you know. So, <clears throat> I'm feeling like I might have to go back to ground zero with these tracks and build them up, but it's probably going to be worth it. And, uh, I think that that's my big project for the next few months is just digging deep on that front and just pushing through the pain and sucking it up and putting in the time to really get it right. And um, man, that was a big moment right there, guys. Happy to share it. So let me know if you have any thoughts on that. Um, otherwise, I hope you guys are out there grinding towards your goals, being honest with yourself about what you want and how you think you are going to get there and what you need to do to get there and then putting that into practice impl implementing it um, and seeking out the knowledge you need to uh, to get from point A to point B and you guys have my support and my blessing no matter what you're out there doing and um, let's uh, let's be the change we want to see in the world guys let's let's really embrace that idea and live it to the fullest every day I'll see you guys tomorrow <laughs>